Um, good morning and welcome to the 39th Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee meeting of 2020. Apologies have been received from Alison Harris and Andy Whiteman, and Graham Simpson is attending on Alison's behalf. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, that is for the committee to take item three in private and whether to consider next steps for its COVID-19 inquiry and issues for its legacy report in private at future meetings. Is the committee agreed? Thank you. That, as that is agreed, we will move on to agenda item two, which is our inquiry on BIFAB, the offshore wind sector, and the Scottish supply chain. And um, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Fiona Hislop this morning, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Fair Work and Culture, who joins us here uh, in the committee room. And her two officials, Mo Rooney, Deputy Director, David Stevenson, Head of Energy Supply Chain, and David Pratt, Head of Planning and Strategy at Marine Scotland, I think join us online. So welcome to all four of you. Um, we'll now turn to questions for the Cabinet Secretary. Sorry, I, I do beg the Cabinet Secretary's pardon. I think the Cabinet Secretary has a brief opening statement, so I'll, I'll in fact, hand over to you at this stage before questions. Thank you, Kavina, and I will be brief. Um, I, I welcome the opportunity to give evidence to the committee today on the current position on BIFAB as part of its inquiry. Uh, while uh, it was unavoidable, I regret that the Board of Directors have put the company into administration. Um, I've been clear throughout this process. Uh, we need to improve the access to work for the Scottish supply chain, and we need to protect the public interest in terms of financial exposure and the jobs that a successful business might support. These priorities reflect our aspirations for offshore wind supply chain manufacturing in Scotland and that Scottish companies benefit from the build-out of these projects, creating jobs, boosting our economy, especially in these challenging times. Our support for BIFAB has been significant. £37.4 million was converted to a 32.4% equity stake and a loan facility of up to £15 million was provided. This financial support ensured that the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm Murray East Pin Piles and the East E&P contracts were completed, creating over 1,000 jobs across the three yards at Arnish, Burnt Island and Methyl. As ever, ministers are required to operate within the law. Uh, no decision taken by ministers can be in contravention of straight aid rules or any other legal provision, including international treaties by which Scotland is bound. I have considered all legal options for continued financial support to BIFAB by the Scottish Government, and my conclusion that the Scottish Government can no longer continue to support the business is based on a range of facts, including the, the, the current position of the business, its trading forecasts, its prospects for future work and the continued no-risk position uh, of the majority shareholder. As a minority shareholder, we've been exhaustive in our consideration of the options available to us to financially support BIFAB from public funds. Uh, the UK policy context also presents challenges. The UK government's damaging contract for difference rules work against Scotland and Scottish supply chains, meaning companies like BIFAB have limited chances of securing work. The CFD auction needs to ensure that project bids are not secured purely on the price per megawatt. The UK government must consider the wider economy and a response to the climate emergency. Thank you, Kimbina. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. If I might ask, first of all, there was an offshore wind summit in January that the Scottish government, uh, I think, organised and uh, tasked the Scottish Offshore, Offshore Wind Energy Council to undertake a short, focused, independent review. Can you update the committee where we're at with that? Um, well, that was obviously took place before I took my position as Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, and I'm, I, as you're aware, I'm not the Minister responsible for, for energy, but uh, I understand there's a number of short uh, sharp pieces of work and reporting that the Offshore Wind Sector Council uh, is conducting, uh, but I'm happy to ask for one of my officials, uh, particularly, I think, David Stevenson of the Energy uh, Lead, to talk to you about that. Well, per perhaps David Stevenson could update us on that. Yes, happy to do so. Uh, good morning, Kavina. Good morning, uh, Committee. Um, due to COVID and a number of other issues over the, the, the summer that we've all experienced. That working group has only just recently kicked off. It will be chaired by uh, Professor Sir Jim MacDonald of uh, Strathclyde University and a number of other key players within the sector, both from the developer community as well as the supply chain. 
Um, the work will is hopefully going to conclude round about um, the Easter time, and it will look at a number of areas within the supply chain, the challenges they face, etc. So, as I say, it's only recently kicked off and uh, just got underway, and hopes to conclude round about the Easter time. Well, I'm wondering um, <clears throat> perhaps if David Stevenson or, or the, the Cabinet Secretary may want to give us a bit more detail about the um, people in Scotland who are involved in offshore wind supply chain, um, who these people are, what are the firms, what are their particular specialisms, how are they going to be brought in to future projects or encouraged into them? So, obviously, there are a number of uh, companies operating in Scotland in this area, particularly in developer supply. We think there's about over 600. Um, in terms of uh, expertise, you've got development and project management, you've got wind turbines, you've got um, insulation commissioning, all those different areas. So, you know, the range uh, is there. I think Professor Jim McDonald is an appropriate person to chair this. My understanding is that they're going to look at uh, specifically specific areas of work and, and as was indicated, they reported report back in, in March. Or March, you know, Easter time, around, around that period. And, Cabinet Secretary, can you tell us what role Scottish Enterprise may have in all of this and why that perhaps hasn't appeared to help in the, the BIFAB situation or previously? Uh, well, Scottish Enterprise has helped, in fact, have invested in terms of the uh, over two million working with Fife Council to improve the state of the yard, particularly in some of the, um, the, the, the ground covering in terms of concreting. The uh, other areas that they would provide would be expertise in uh, offshore uh, wind in terms of support. There's um, supply chain uh, meetings that meet the buyer events. Um, they would also look at uh, diversi diversification support uh, programmes. So there's a number of things that they'd be involved in. So, for example, if you take the the uh, 60 million, uh, 62 million pounds uh, investment in the energy transition fund uh, that I announced in July, Scottish Enterprise are heavily involved in that, and that's looking, for example, um, at renewables in the transition. Uh, for many companies in the northeast, uh, and, and looking at that area, um, obviously part of that was looking at hydrogen as well. So SE are involved in a number of, of, of areas in terms of looking at supply chain development, in terms of the the general tr um, energy transition, and in terms of uh, the issue around BIFAB, they have been uh, obviously uh, active and interested in in looking to support the company, particularly in, in bearing in mind who might be interested in taking on. The, um, the the yard and in terms of the on the company, um, in terms of uh, that operation, they've obviously provided leads to the administrator as well. So I mean they're involved in a whole variety of different ways, both immediately but also strategically, um, looking at the the supply chain aspects. Yes, I mean I, I'm aware they've been involved in specific ways in that, but ultimately I think you would accept that with regard to the BIFAB, ultimately that's not been the success that we all would have wanted, has it? Well, the, in, in terms of the, the situation by five, you know, clearly we would have wanted that company to be successful under the ownership of D.F. Barnes and J.P. Driver. Um, that hasn't happened. I think the, a variety of factors, and I've, I've said consistency. There's a, you know, there's a, it's a combination of different factors involved in that. But clearly, for for the workforce, that's uh, uh, you know real challenging, and that's why I think it's it's uh, helpful to know that the administration is going to try and see if the the company can be sold as a going concern. In terms of SE's involvement, you know, the the uh, there was government involvement right at the beginning when the Beatrice uh, contract and the previous company was in in uh, difficulty, and obviously completing Beatrice was a, a hugely important for a number of reasons, not least for the workers, but also to make sure that we could deliver on our uh, our objectives in terms of climate change and make sure this major, major uh, windshore, uh, offshore windshore uh, development was completed. So that intervention uh, you know, took place with government support. Um, SE will have been involved in, in, in different aspects of that. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of the decision making, and the involvement that was at the Scottish Government level, as was obviously the uh, subsequent uh, discussions with JV Driver, who had previously been interested in BIFAB um, prior, um, you know, prior, prior to uh, April 18, but uh, eventually that discussion took place in terms of 
that company coming in to, you know, I suppose rejuvenate the yard is what they obviously wanted to do, and to to see that as a, you know a stepping stone into wider European development. So you know that was all done uh, a period, you know, obviously before my time as as cabinet secretary for the economy. But uh, in looking back at records, that was. Uh, that was obviously taking place in 17 and, and, and 18. In terms of the current situation, um, that's obviously, you know, SE would, would work with a company with their agreement to work with a company. But remember, you know, the company, you know, in terms of uh, the, the ownership there, were reluctant to necessarily um, engage um, others in, in their work. So therefore, we were trying to get them to, for example, to get third party investment to try and, you know, find ways of improving the cash flow um, uh, proposition and including improving um, the position that they had on working capital because we were clearly coming to the end of the road in terms of what we could legally and financially provide. Our loans, uh, our loan that we provided, that £15 million, was obviously being maxed out. So um, that's the kind of context that obviously the difficulties we're finding. I think, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the SE's position, you know, the, the main op operation just now is helping identify if there are companies that would want to take this, uh, the, the take by fab over. I mean, you referred in your, your opening statement to legal advice and the legal position, but of course, um, I don't think you've shared your legal advice with the committee. And of course, legal advice can vary. I mean, different lawyers take different views of different things. And a witness told us that you had said that to her that the French have more vociferous lawyers. So um, the law and legal advice is not a black and white thing, you know, it's not this or that. Indeed, that's why we have appeal courts, because even judges can differ and take different views on things. So if the committee cannot see the legal advice received, um, then how is the committee to be satisfied that the position is in law, as you've said to the committee it is? Um, I don't remember discussing French lawyers with NMD, but um, in terms of uh, legal advice. I think the, the you know, you've got you have some very experienced MSPs on this committee, and um, they'll be familiar with the Scottish government's position. That although we can identify that there there is legal advice, we we don't you know share that legal advice or indeed um, the source of that legal advice. That's not something that's unusual. Um, to the Scottish Government, or indeed this Scottish Government, it was the same position that was taken by the Labour Liberal Democrat um, executive uh, previously, uh, So, and indeed the UK Government, and indeed other governments. So uh, in terms of, of that, I can understand that there may be different uh, legal opinions taken on the information that people have available, but it's quite clearly the case that the advice that we've been given uh, certainly would would indicate that we would not be able to operate on a legal basis uh, financially in terms of providing more support to the company, uh, which included obviously the assurance. Uh, but it's not just that as, as well. Obviously, in terms of our investment, we had uh, provided uh, the working capital for that company um, over the period um, of its operation under its new ownership. And I think anybody would recognise that you, they would expect a majority shareholder to uh, provide both investment and indeed working capital and to ensure the cash flow position of that company. It's not the responsibility of the minority shareholder to do that. So we provided loans to, to help the company. We provided support. But, sorry, forgive me, Cabinet Secretary. My question is, um, I understand the parameters that you've set out yeah. in response on the legal advice question. How is this committee to be satisfied that the, the legal advice on which, as you, you say, the Scottish Government has based its approach in decision making um, is, is correct, given, given, as I said, legal advice can vary? Well, the same way that every committee in this parliament for 20 years has had to uh, accept that when the Scottish Government or indeed the previous Scottish Executive uh, relays that the uh, legal advice that they've, been, they've received means that they can no longer do something in, in relation to state aid would have to to accept that that's the government's position and um, you know in terms of your own evidence that's up to you to provide in terms of your, your own evidence but you know uh, what i can give you as evidence is is our position but i think it would be and, and there's good reason for it because uh you, you would have a situation where legal advice could not be provided to government in confidence that uh, all legal advice would be written and developed in a way su in such a way that it could be accessible by anyone at any time, and that's right. not the way that well, most governments operate. I, I understand your position on that. Yeah. But I suppose if if I add the question, um, has the government taken 
uh, a second opinion or other opinions from different lawyers on the issues in question to check the initial legal advice received? So, so I, again, I would refer to the fact that I can let you know that, legal, that we have legal advice, but not the source of that legal advice. And that's well, I'm, not, I'm not asking for the source. I'm just asking if you've taken separate legal advice we, we, from the we, initial we, to double-check the we position. Have, uh, I could say we have uh, absolutely thoroughly uh, analysed the situation. Uh, I think the main issue, and it should be more obvious in this case and perhaps other cases where committees are looking for an indication, um, that the issue comes, you know, comes down to would, would a minority shareholder uh, do what we had done in a similar situation? You know, would they have, or would they have done something differently? And you know, on the basis that the, uh, I mean, stated you know, issues are fairly straightforward. You know, in in terms of uh, the investment, if the majority shareholder is no longer able to, or willing to provide. Um, investment, working capital or other support for the company, um, would it be appropriate or would it be deemed as uh, state aid because no other source of uh, funding had been provided for that company, either by the majority shareholder or by the majority shareholder seeking third party investment? Right. Um, a follow up from Alex Rowley before we come to questions from Morris Golden. A brief follow up, please, Mr. Rowley. A cabinet secretary, you mentioned about the contract for difference and you have um, been having discussions with the UK government. Have you put forward a Scottish government view on contract for difference and is there any progress being made with the UK government given that the contract for difference is going to impact going ahead on any other contracts we're likely to get? Um, I think that's a key question. Uh, the, the, the issue of contract for difference is not new. It's been a, a difficulty for some time in terms of uh, the provisions that were made, particularly to try and uh, drive down the price of uh, electricity. I think previously your, your Westminster colleague Ed Milband had been keen to make sure that um, the contracts that were, were established for offshore wind uh, would uh, result in uh, the, the, the price of the consumer going down. That's been something that's shared by subsequent um, UK Conservative governments and that's been their position. Uh, my, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse has pressed the UK government on contract for difference changes for some time. Um, in terms of uh, progress on that, I think it's positive that the UK government has now, in just in the last few weeks, uh, embarked on a consultation on changes for contract for difference. Uh, part of that should be, one, the ambitions of uh, the percentage, and that's what they can do that we would have more difficulties with under our powers, but what they can do under contract for difference to try and make sure they can set uh, certain uh, targets in terms of what they would want to achieve and to ensure that that's demonstrated and can be enforced as part of the contract for different um, proposals. It's why when people say, what about other countries, why can they do more? It's because their criteria for, for, for agreement for licences um, will have uh, some kind of local protection within state aid you know, uh, aspects to allow that supply chain development, whereas because the imperative for, to, for the UK government to date has been to drive the cost of electricity down and, 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 and that's a, you know, it's a, a position they've taken. Um, that means it's a race to the bottom. So everything comes about the, the contract price and tender, which is why you're seeing the likes of China and UAE, which would, you know, would labour um, constraints that we would not you know, want to see uh, happen in here. But they can obviously have much cheaper labour in terms of their, their provision. And, and, and that's a problem. I do think, though, um, globally, rethinking supply chains will be an issue. Uh, quality of product is an issue that has to be addressed as well. Uh, but I think it can be far more uh, done collectively um, across the UK to improve the situation. And so therefore, the contract for difference is out to consultation, I think, to the 18th of January. And we'll make sure and share. I'll, I'll ask my uh, colleagues from the Energy Department to to share with you what we've been what been seeing up to date about improvements to contract for difference, and also what we will be putting to the UK government as part of that as well. But I will be impressing in the work that um, I, that my officials are, are are doing with the UK government in relation to improving um, one, you know, trying to support the BIFAB situation and how we can support it in terms of investment through the administration administration process for MD coming in if there's opportunities there, um, uh, but also in terms of the future supply chain to make sure the contract for difference uh, can be affected. The problem we've got is we've got, all, I suppose, legacy licences and the ones that we're seeing just now, whether it's Seagreen or indeed 
um, energy are all subject to the historic contract for different positions because obviously the time lag, and I'm not sure, I mean, this again, it's not my area of expertise. I, I, I do business support and economy, but the, on the energy side, uh, as you'll know, that the time lag, you know, in terms of setting the licenses and then the contracts being awarded, there's a time lag on that. So it's important that the sooner th those changes can be made, they'll help improve, for example, the Scotland, potentially sub subsequent sub Scotland uh, leases, but also other supply chain issues. But I think that's a major issue. And I've obviously followed the evidence to your committee and you've heard from the industry, you've heard um, from uh, David Driver themselves and you know, you've heard from the unions and you've, you've heard from me that this is key, we need to get that changed. The good news is the UK government's acknowledged that, they've embarked on that consultation and we can try and influence that. And I think in terms of the timing of, I'm not sure the timing of the committee's report, but you could be influential in um, influencing that as well. Right, thank you. Uh, Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you've just touched on this regarding particularly the downturn in oil and gas and our net zero targets is going to mean diversification of the supply chain is increasingly more important. I just wondered what research the Scottish Government may have done around how other European countries are supporting their indigenous supply chains. So again, not necessarily uh, an area I'll, I, I, I can touch on. Um, I might bring in my officials if they've got something they want to, to uh, contribute to that. But clearly, one of the differences we are aware of is that business about licensing and, and what you can put in. And what is your driver? Is it cheap electricity or is it an imperative on the supply chain? I think that dial is shifting from the UK government, which is welcome. Um, and that's what we can see in, in, in different other areas. But I think in terms of the opportunities, because we have got um, the, you know, the, the amount of offshore wind opportunities we, ha we have in Scotland, and indeed you can see it in the North East and in, in UK waters, is substantial. And the opportunities, particularly for um, you know, use of uh, you know, uh, offshore wind and storage and hydrogen, that whole supply chain that the you know, other countries in Europe and the European Union are very interested in. There's obviously that there's a common interest in, in developing those those sites. So in terms of uh, the opportunities to do that, I think it's very strong. But in terms of the comparators, uh, you know, you, you're working at different levels. It's also interesting, uh, you know, the skill levels are important as well, and that's what's very attractive. And talking to developers who you know, want to come into Scotland in, in the future, uh, I've, I've been doing that in recent times. And, and in terms of, you know, my experience, the attraction of Scotland is its skills, skill base. Other countries, uh, what I understand is that they can be uh, limited by their domestic skill base. So it's not just a supply chain, there are other factors in it. And I suppose for a successful renewable sector, what I'd like to see is to make sure that we're operating on a number of areas. Yes, contract for, for difference being uh, to an advantage uh, to supply chains, but also making sure we're developing our skills uh, skill supply. So that's some of the comparative differences with different companies. But I don't know whether um, colleagues um, from energy would want to, officials from energy would want to reflect on what they know about different other countries and the research that have been done in, in their positions to add to the comments I've made. Does anybody want to come in? I'm not quite sure how this how we yeah. actually work. Um, David Stevenson. <laughs> I should probably wear my glasses if I'm looking at this screen. <laughs> David, um, I think. There, there isn't. Sorry, sorry. Um, there isn't really any um, comparable on looking at other European countries. But what the the report that Sir Jim is referring to earlier on, and I'm quite sure with uh, with his permission, we can send you the terms of reference of who's, uh, what that group will um, undertake. But the kind of premise of it is, is to understand the challenges and barriers that our supply chain currently face. Um, and they will go out. There's a, there's a core executive committee of, of 10 people in that, and I can run through them, or as I said, we can quite sure uh, pass on the terms of reference. But the, the main driver of that is to understand the challenges and the barriers that our own supply chain face and not just looking at offshore wind, but also looking at what we can learn from other technologies, perhaps like aerospace, um, automotive, et cetera. And look how, even, even from food and drink, and how these companies are operating in this space and how we can collectively work together um, to make sure that our supply chain is, is fit for purpose and can maximize the results from the offshore wind opportunity. Um, but I say that that's the main premise of what Sir Jim's group is looking at, and I say I'm quite happy to share the, the terms of reference um, subject to Sir Jim's approval for that, which I wouldn't envisage would be a problem. 
Thanks. So just as a follow-up, just to confirm, in terms of to date, we don't, or the Scottish Government hasn't conducted research around supporting supply chains, how that's conducted in other European countries. Is that the we, case? We, I suppose it's what you mean by research. I mean, are we aware of what other countries do? Yes, generally, but in terms of a discrete piece of research, mm -hmm. that's what obviously one of the areas that the the um, Ulster Wind uh, Council work on, uh, obviously chaired by Professor Jim McDonald, who's got great experience internationally, not just obviously in Scotland. Okay, thank you. And, and just as a kind of interlinked point, Cabinet Secretary, the, the GMB union told us in evidence that almost every offshore wind turbine in Scotland had been built by a state aid backed company. I was just wondering what the parameters are in terms of why other countries that have stated that companies are able to produce these offshore wind turbines in Scotland isn't is it down to price? Uh, that's a, that would be a strategic decision to take um, stakes or indeed have nationalised energy companies. So if you look at the success of of Norway, for example, or even some of the French companies, you'll see that actually that's a strategic decision uh, by the company to take ownership in an energy company. Now, obviously, there's a balance that this, com this uh, committee will be aware of between reserved and devolved areas in terms of intervention and, uh, uh, or, and indeed the quantum you would need to take a, a majority stake uh, in a major energy company. But you know, I'm not sure that in terms of nationalisation of uh, you know, energy companies, that's something that uh, either you know, this UK government or indeed previous UK government of other other uh, political persuasions have, have done. That's the difference. And, and that, I think, is probably quite fundamental in terms of looking about how other countries have managed to exploit their energy resources. Um, Norway is quite clear in terms of what they've done over decades in terms of that um, form of a more strategic positioning and ownership. Um, and obviously you can see that in, in, in France in particular. But that's the sort of thing that, in terms of looking what other companies ca can do. Um, and and that's, that ensures that they can then, uh, you know, probably in terms of their issues, look at the supply chain aspects and what they can do to support. Now, to be fair to the non-state aid owned energy companies that we have in, in this country, and, you know, um, SAC is a good example where, you know, they have clearly in, in different areas, and we've seen that in different contracts, uh, tried to, to support domestic supply chains when they can do that. But obviously, they're accountable to their shareholders. And if you've got private shareholders looking for returns on, on their shares, then that's who they're answerable to. They're not answerable you know, to the government. And especially if they've got a contract for difference, it doesn't mean that they have to do that. And in fact, incentivizes them to do something different, which is actually to give work elsewhere. And to be fair to SSE, uh, you know, we were very clear to them that we would want to see that contract go, the Seagreen contract, uh, or even the carved out um, uh, area for um, the so, so, correct myself for Seagreen, we wanted to make, ensure that they uh, could try and provide some work for BIFAB if, if they could. Now, if they could have done on a price basis, they would have done. But actually, when we pressed them again, the, the price quantum increased. So that's the difference between private ship. Well, uh, it's mm. kind of fairly obvious between you know the, the interest there. But that might be a recommendation from from this committee, for example, that the you know the UK should embark on you know state-owned um, energy companies uh, or significant uh, stakes. Just in the the context of of BIFAB going forward. We've seen in other sectors like aerospace or textiles, as you've been be aware, where Scotland really struggles to uh, compete with low margin, high volume yep. uh, production. Uh, do you see a future for Scotland in more you know, high end, you know, niche supply chain markets? Or do you think Scotland could compete with, you know, your, your, your more general fabrication? Um, I'm not ruling out, um, obviously, and, and, and I'm very supportive of fabrication work, but I think you make a, a reasonable uh, suggestion that actually looking at what we can com compete with, uh, then it's high-skilled high uh, engineering. And, that's, and that actually is the point where, in terms of the support for the sector, uh, it's important to, to look at different areas and, 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 and how can we ensure that, you know, from, from my perspective, the skill base that we have in Fife can be used, yes, for fabrication, 
uh, but to make sure that we can try and do it in a way that we, we're not competing with £2.70 an hour, for example, in, in, in labour costs, because that becomes you know, a real real issue. But there's also an issue that globally they have to look at, you know, people have to look at the kind of transportation and whether there's, if you look at some of the challenges in climate change, you look at um, you know, challenges that governments will want to do uh, cooperatively. We've obviously got a free market in terms of where you can get, you know, you can get fabrication uh, for for the the sector uh, delivered and at different cost base, but obviously you've got transportation costs as part of that, and so therefore you know, but that's not in the gift of the Scottish government to determine. But collectively and globally, there's an issue: why are we transporting uh, fabrication from one part of the world to the other, and the energy that's used in that, and should that be? be considered so that might be some of the kind of more strategic thinking about how we tackle climate change in terms of transportation but in terms of the domestic market i think we have absolutely got uh, high-end engineering skills if you look at what we're doing with enmis uh, low-cost carbon in, uh, and and in, in terms of uh, zero um, zero carbon delivery and lightweight carbon manufacturing there's different whole of areas where our expertise is extremely strong and in, certainly in this area again I'm, uh, I mean I'm not the Minister for Energy but you know in terms of our capabilities they are very strong in this this, this area so I would want to see us try and make sure that we play to our strengths um, and that's what I would hope and that's why we want to to work with the administrators particularly with MyFab to make sure that we're playing to our strengths in terms of attracting a company uh, in to take on that, that site that sees the potential for a growing domestic supply chain with a contract for difference that is altered to make sure there's an incentive in that and we're already seeing uh, increased interest in doing work in Scotland precisely because the levers are changing that would enable us uh, and, and having a, as a requirement that they would really want to make sure that they've got a Scottish supply chain but your point about about making sure that we're um, providing the uh, a high-end engineering expertise, that skill base, um, I think is really important. And again, that's part of how do we grow that sector, how we make sure we've got the skills training. Um, and I'm not sure how much I can say, but obviously we've got the Climate Change Plan uh, convener being published. Uh, I think there's a statement this week, although I'm losing track of the timetable for when things are happening, so I don't want to preempt anything. But the skills aspect of, uh, of that is really important as well. So there's going to be um, obviously an accompanying support on skills, and that's what we need to make sure that we've got the high end uh, continuing and the volume of uh, people being trained in that area. So I apologise to the presiding officer if I've preempted or, or said anything I probably shouldn't have done. <laughs> Very brief uh, sub supplementary, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for whetting my appetite about the climate change statement. Um, just on transportation costs, um, when I worked for Zero Waste Scotland uh, and I refer members to my register of interests, uh, I was speaking to a company in Montrose who said it was cheaper for them to ship uh, via container to China than it was for them to transport their steel pilings uh, via lorry to uh, Glasgow. Uh, I'm not necessarily asking for a, a, yeah. a, a reply specifically on that just now, but has there been any um, research done on the cost transportation costs? Because this could obviously be relevant for, for BIFAB, even if you could write to the committee yeah, if I mean, you don't I'll, have the answer. I'll follow up with the, uh, and ask our, our transport and energy colleagues to identify that. But to me, in a global context, I think that is an issue. And if you have got um, a global sense of uh, you know, what, where is the energy being used? You know, we're obviously you know, um, providing and, and sourcing renewable energy, but if the energy costs are expensive, ship containments to China, but obviously the price, you know, there's obviously a, perhaps the, 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 it's the energy used as, as, the, as the expense, but then again, it's, it's uh, the cheap oil or whatever that kind of uh, is, is being used in some of these, these sources. But I, I think that's some of the things that I think globally need to look at if we're really going to, as a, 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 you know, as a, as a planet, try and tackle some of these issues. So who, who knows where those debates might go as far as the climate change negotiations are. But I think it's worth looking at. I don't know the details, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask my officials to follow up with that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Now, Colin Beatty, who joins us remotely. I can't see him. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, now BIFAB is an administration, and I believe the Lloyds have been appointed as the administrators. Can you provide a timeline of the events and the factors involved in that from the Scottish Government's perspective? Um, so, I'm just trying to think when you want the timeline from, but I mean, in terms of uh, the issues from the probably the, the summer when there was a real concern that the CD contract would not be secured. 
Why is the sequin contract um, important? Because it would have provided a future pipeline of, of, of work, but also um, in terms of uh, support the cash flow of, of the, the company. It was becoming quite clear that there were real issues around working capital, and, and I will repeat that the working capital for the company has been provided by the Scottish Government, um, and that included uh, a £50 million, uh, loan during the uh, spring period of 2020. Uh, so in, in August, we were clear to uh, the, the, the majority shareholder, JB Driver, that we had concerns about the securing this contract, that that would have knock-on effects on LNG. And we were also concerned about um, the balances of the company in terms of its um, cash flow issues. So that had been evident for some time. Uh, we were reassured uh, continually by... Uh, JV Driver that they would be seeking um, alternative funding to help cover the cash flow constraints that the company had. Uh, that never came to fruition. Um, and so therefore, you know, we, we tried to explore with the, and, and we worked cooperatively with JV Driver looking at all the different options of what would be required. Um, they, could, they, they, they at one point uh, suggested that they could transfer uh, their uh, shares to the Scottish Government and, and, and the Scottish Government take over the company, that would not have allowed us uh, to provide a state aid compliant additional funding for the company either in assurances or indeed uh, working capital. Uh, we looked at a number of different scenarios to, to try and help secure particularly the NNG contract because that obviously um, would, would make a uh, considerable difference to the immediate issue, particularly for the workforce and providing their activity. Uh, when it became clear that uh, the cash flow issue was becoming pretty, you know, very perilous and there was no prospect um, of, of work uh, and a continued pipeline for the company, obviously they had to make their own decision about what they did as a board. Um, and uh, uh, clearly uh, they took the board themselves took the decision uh, to, to go into administration uh, on the basis that they, they had the, the difficulties the company was in. Um, and the administrators obviously have just been were appointed, and uh, I think that was announced yesterday, so that's now public. Um, I was due to make a statement this afternoon to that effect in Parliament, but I think the timetable for Parliament has moved, so I think the statement is now tomorrow. Or it, it's, I think the Bureau may be considered that. Um, so that's, that's the issue. We have um, made, obviously made contact with uh, the, the administrators, uh, and we're trying to make sure that the administrators understand what would be the importance <coughs> to... Uh, secure the future uh, and the, and what we would try and achieve, what we would think would be in the interest of both the workforce and that, and we're working with STUC as well to to ensure that the that those uh, needs and the needs of of the workforce are identified as part of what might be the solution going forward. And we're also working with um, SE and in and High uh, because obviously we've got to Arnish, uh, Methil and Burnt Island and in terms of the, the individual yards, what might be the, the interest there. And uh, obviously trying to work with the, the uh, administrators to ensure that there are no uh, redundancies. There are approximately 30 uh, permanent staff. Obviously, there's uh, many contractors involved with BIFAB, but we're working to ensure that there's no redundancies either. So we're trying to influence that to secure um, the best outcome uh, for the yard, but also for the uh, workforce and indeed the, the wider uh, production supply chain. Uh, if that's what you're looking for, uh, Mr Beattie, that's what was, that gives you, a, I think, a narrative. Yeah, but, uh, I was... Quite interesting one thing you said there, and uh, please correct me if I picked you up wrong. My understanding from what you said is that uh, um, driver were going to be working at providing working capital. They were they were they were working to raise working capital. Uh, they told us that they would look to achieve um, additional funding for the company, but that was never realised. Then. Perhaps you can clarify something that uh, we were told by D.F. Barnes, and I would ask if you agree with this, and I uh, quote, the final purchase discussions and agreements always envisaged that the Scottish Government would be the primary financier of the business as it recovered from the Beatrice project. Now, that doesn't seem to agree with what you were saying earlier, or your understanding earlier, Perhaps you can say whether you agree with D.F. Barnes' statement there. 
Um, so, if you, what I've just relayed is obviously the most recent uh, issues in terms of administration, but if you go way back to 2017, when the company, the, the then company, uh, was facing uh, potentially insolvency, and the support uh, provided to deliver the Beatrice uh, contract in particular, and to broker obviously the finances that were going on between different parties at that time, and then um, GB Driver subsequently uh, uh, took on the majority sh shareholding. Uh, the agreement at that time and the business plan, the pre-acquisition business plan, and again, I know the committee had asked for us to share that. That's not in our gift. That's for DF Barnes. It uh, was quite specific that they would provide um, uh, capital uh, in the term of insurances uh, and also use their parenting bond guarantee and that they would be providing financial support for the company. And I think anybody looking at it fairly straight from a business point of view, it would be highly unusual um, for the majority shareholder not to be the first port of call for um, one, insurances in this, this industry, but also in terms of um, the uh, provision of working capital, particularly when the company was becoming, you know, cash insolvent, uh, which was obviously uh, led to, to led, led it into administration. They had maxed out the funding that we provided. We, as part of the, the the more recent loan that we provided, that was to help them to try and secure the C Green contract as well. So going back to the pre-acquisition business plan, it was quite clear in that business plan that they would take up responsibility for providing. Um, assurances and capital through um, their, their, you know, their sources and through their parent body, and also to help try and provide some of the contracts as well, uh, because obviously that was key to the success of the country c company. So you know, the idea that the Scottish government, you know, would I think I think their reference potentially mm. when they, they gave evidence to the committee was to the Beatrice contract, where quite clearly we did ensure the funding was available to complete. And, the, and that we would be the, the primary source of funding to complete and support the Beatrice contract. But that was way back in 2017. That's not obviously uh, keeping the company running over the next three years. That wasn't, um, that wasn't part of the, the business plan proposals. And yet, Cabinet Secretary, we took evidence uh, from DF Barnes uh, j just a week or two ago there, and they made it very clear that it was always intended that the main financial backer of BIFAB would be the Scottish Government. And they made it very clear that was their understanding of the situation right up until it went into administration. And that doesn't seem to square with what you're saying yourself. Uh, I, I think it would be highly unusual for any business, and you've worked in business, uh, I, I'm aware that uh, the situation that the minor minority shareholder would be the, the, the main financing uh, arm of any company and you know if you take the, the position of DF Barnes they also set out that they uh, would provide assurances and, and they did for example for the Murray East Pins but the issue then became uh, risk issues as uh, because of the financially perilous situation that the company found itself in uh, to secure uh, future guarantees and therefore uh, as would be expected and, and a lot of people looking at the situation says why on earth would the government and the minority shareholder be needing to provide the assurances well it's because the majority can't because of the risk profile of of the company and if the parent shareholder uh, DF Barnes aren't prepared to, to to support the company either through assurances or indeed even even in working capital uh, uh, between contracts and that's a real that's a real problem so uh, you know they can say what they say to to the committee, but you know if you look at the and if you if they were you know if they were to provide you with the the pre acquisition business plan, it's absolutely clear that that was the provision as part of that arrangement. Uh, subsequently, obviously the uh, loans were were during the course of eighteen, uh, the loans were uh, transferred into equity again. That was to help support the company, but you know you, the the situation the, the idea that um, the the Scottish government would forever and a day be the be the finance the main financier for the company, I think, is, is not correct. Now, we've discussed already a great deal about state aid and the limitations around state aid. DF Barnes were very clear that the primary reason that BIFAB did not succeed was the lack of, if you will, state aid from the Scottish Government. And they seem to, they seem to make it all hinge on that one issue. And yet it's, it seems, from what you're saying yourself, is there are far wider issues involved in getting up to that point of, uh, of uh, going into administration. 
Yes, and, and I've said consistently there's a, a culmination of a, a number of factors. You know, uh, obviously the, the reluctance to provide um, uh, assurance and to, to take a no-risk position by the company is one. Um, also the timing, I think, of the energy contract for a number of reasons. It was delayed. Um, obviously, pandemics had an impact on a number of these these areas. Uh, not securing sea green uh, obviously, obviously had an impact as well, but in terms of the uh, the, the issue around state aid, I, I think uh, the criticism from DF Barnes, if, if it was relayed to you the way it's been relayed to me in terms of um, discussions with them, even as far back as the summer when I spoke to them, they, they, they had thought that it would be easier to secure contracts uh, in, uh, in in UK waters than 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 it is and that their experience in Canada is, dif is, is different and obviously their operation of state uh, support or I'm not saying as much state support how you can secure contracts um, is different than it is in the UK and they found the UK operation of state aid far more restrictive than they'd previously thought and I spent quite a lot of time to explain to them that actually this is not necessarily something that's in Sc the Scottish Government's gift we are I suppose doubly constrained in state aid because ministers have got specific responsibilities in the Scotland Act that UK ministers don't have. But even then, we're all operating with a, within the constraints of, of state aid, and, and they found that problematic and, it, and wasn't what their expectations w w were. Now, my understanding is that uh, the UK government actually supports the Scottish government's position on state aid in this. Is there any indication that DF Barnes lobbied the UK government at all? Um, I, I'm not aware that they did, but obviously, you know, we, we, in, in one of the meetings I had, and it was after the, the suggestion, actually, the unions wanted us to uh, approach the UK government. I think they're subsequently being critical that we <laughs> approached the UK government, but it was actually the unions that wanted us to do that. Uh, we were of the view that it would be problematic for the UK government as well, but, we, you know, it was, I think it was, uh, it, it was definitely, uh, you know, obviously assuring to both uh, the unions and... and Indeed, the company that, that we did so, but I'm not aware that UK, the, the company themselves approached the, the UK government, but the UK government looked at the, the situation in relation to, to state aid um, for, from their own perspective, and they, uh, they took the, the view that it would be uh, legally and financially uh, not uh, possible for them to provide support. Because that was the other option: is could they step in to provide support, uh, working capital, or indeed the assurance? And that's what I put to them: is that you know, could could is this something that they could do as opposed to ourselves? Because we had obviously gone to the limit of what we could do. Also, because ministers um, are responsible for the point in time they take decisions. Uh, that was my position for the UK government. They had a bit more flex on the basis that they would need to be taken to court or somebody would need to challenge them, uh, and, and so therefore their um, responsibilities in relation to state aid are slightly, are slightly different. Um, they understood the differences between um, our rules, our tighter rules uh, as ministers, as, as part of the Scotland Act, compared to, to their position, uh, but they, they took the time to look at that. I think the, the initial discussion I had with Michael Gove, uh, he obviously thought that it would be very difficult for, for us uh, in terms of state aid. They could see that, uh, but they took their time to consider um, through different departments. And, they, they, and, and to be fair, they, I, I, I appreciate the work they, they put in to look at, uh, to see what was possible, if they could step in. And uh, their, their judgment was they couldn't. However, um, I didn't want to leave it there. And so therefore, the, the, the suggestion of having a working group to look at the issues of um, general supply chains going forward, but also what could be done in relation to BIFAP uh, was something that you know, we've agreed to take up and, and, to, and, and to work on. But if you're saying, did they agree Thank with us? The answer is yes, they did agree with us. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beattie. Um, you referred to a pre-acquisition business plan there, Cabinet Secretary. Is that something that you've seen? Yes. And is that something you can share with the committee? Um, as I'm, I've, I'm, I wrote to the committee, um, I'm not sure you'll ever see that letter. That I know that you were keen for, to see that. Um, it's, we, uh, we have approached AF Barnes to get their agreement to, to release that. Uh, they, they haven't, uh, we haven't heard from them with an the agreement for that to date. Mm -hmm. But I'm relaying what my knowledge is of that business plan. Right. You just you appreciate it's difficult for the committee to come to a view on that if we've not seen it, although yeah. you share with us your yeah. view of it. Um, so. I mean, I, th I would encourage DF Barnes to provide the pre-business, uh, the, the pre-acquisition business plan to the committee, but it's in their, their gift. You're saying that you cannot provide it to us? 
I think it would be an well. I think it would be inappropriate to do so. Remember, um, the the, the you know, we have business relations with lots of different companies, and if they were to if they were to be aware that we were providing uh, commercial confident uh, in confidence information to the parliament, that would then would become you know public. Uh, that make affect relations that we would have with any company that we work with. We've got to uh, operate with a, a degree of trust with any commercial uh, company. That they, obviously, that, that, that we can work with. We will. I, I will. I'm keen that you do see it, but so I will do what I can to to, to ensure that you can get it. But uh, that I, I am in some constraints. But I'll take advice as to what would be appropriate or not. But if you understand my reluctance to do that without the company's agreement, right. Um, I think Richard Lyle wanted to come in with a brief supplementary and also um, Graham Simpson, I think, indicated, first of all, so perhaps Graham Simpson on a point raised and then Richard Lyle uh, before we move on to further questions, I think, from Graham Simpson. So Graham Simpson first and then Richard yeah. Lyle. Thank, thank you, uh, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, when DF Barnes appear before the committee, I try to get an answer out of them as to how much they had invested um, in BIFAB, and, and they, wouldn't get, they wouldn't answer the question. And no wonder, because the answer was four pounds. And for that four pounds, they got a 67% share of BIFAB. Um, now, the Scottish Government put in 37 million and got a 32.4% stake. There's a big discrepancy there. Why is that? That would have been the agreements that would have made at the time for the company to run particularly the Beatrice contract to make sure that that was uh, achievable. That was important for a number of different reasons. Uh, clearly, the jobs in, in Fife, but also uh, the uh, delivery of that major wind farm was hugely important to the development of the whole sector. It was, a, it was, it was very symbolic that, that that was achieved and, and delivered. In terms of the d discussions about share ownership, um, you know, the other option, which obviously could have happened but didn't happen at that time, was a, a state ownership of that company and that was obviously something that the then uh, ministers and uh, decided against but how how is it that the scottish taxpayer can pay an average of 278 pounds per share and df barnes can pay one pound per share we the scottish taxpayer we get a minority stake in the company and not even a seat on the board and uh, and this canadian company for four pounds gets a majority of the company. What's going on? So the issue was to ensure that the uh, yard was saved, that the jobs were supported, that the Beatrice contract was delivered, um, and ensuring that the, there was continuation of the operation of that company, an agreement for a, um, a takeover was required. Now, DF Barnes had previously been interested in, in BIFAB back in 2016. Unfortunately, that didn't take place at that time uh, because of the an un untimely death of the, uh, a senior uh, manager in BIFAB at that time. By the time that they came, became involved um, in in the view to take over the company, uh, it would have been highly unlikely and extremely uh, difficult for any company to take over the, the BIFAB because of the financial state that it was in. So that's why at that time, to deliver the Beatrix contract, uh, we provided the loans and they were subsequently drawn down as part of equity to provide the support. Now, what we understand and what the agreement was in terms of the pre-acquisition business plan, that what was the arrangement and the benefit to the taxpayer of bringing in DF Barnes was the continuation of the work, the assurances that they could provide to deliver and achieve major contracts, uh, but also to ensure that the livelihoods of the many people that relied on BIFAB could be supported. So that is obviously what we uh, what we invested in as part of our government support. That also helped deliver, and I've listed in my introductory remarks, the, the contracts um, that were so important as part of the development of uh, offshore uh, uh, offshore renewable energy, and and and, and I've relayed that. And you know, so, if you're saying should we have walked away and let the company fold in, uh, if, the, if if your position, Mr. Simpson, is that we should have just walked away and let the company fold, um, or we should have taken over in in a state ownership, 
um, that's that's what we've been left if you if we hadn't done what we've done. So the, the, what we were bringing in was their expertise, the you know their acumen, their knowledge of the market, and what they could do and, and run the company. That they would be the board that could run the company. That we would not be directly involved in running the company. They would be responsible for that. So that's what the arrangement was. Had we not done that, the alternative was to um, let the company fail and make uh, that would have led to Beatrice not being completed satisfactorily um, and the, and if it, if that wasn't the alternative then the only other alternative would have been state aid owner uh, state ownership at that time which was obviously something that the messes uh, involved at that point did not want to do so I'm not sure which of the, all those alternatives that you prefer I, I have not argued uh, about whether you should have stepped in or not my question was about the deal that you ended up with, and it seems to me a pretty rotten deal if, if the taxpayer is putting in the vast amount of money, the vast amount of money, 32 million, as, uh, 37 million in fact, plus uh, uh, extra, which takes it up to 52 million. But in terms of shareholding, 37 million, you get a minority stake, and the other side of the deal, four pounds, for 67% share of the company. The, that's, the, a that's a rotten deal. That's got nothing to do with whether you should have stepped in or not. The, 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 the funding that was provided, the vast majority of funding was not to the company and not, to, and, and, and not for the benefit of JB Driver. The majority of the funding was to complete was to complete the Beatrice contract. And completing the Beatrice contract was strategically important. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle, you wanted to come in on some of these points, so I'll let you come in. Yes, Karen said to we know why the Scottish Government got involved, and I think that's got to come out and, and you know, mainly to save a company, save jobs, and complete the contract. So, but what I'm interested in knowing is how many contracts has BIFAR bid for since the Scottish Government made its investment? And how many have they won? Okay. Um, if any. That's, I, I might ask my officials to, to come in on that. Obviously, since I came into responsibility in this, uh, this area was the Sea Green and NNG. Uh, there was good prospects uh, this time last year that they could secure uh, both those contracts and be able to deliver them and have the working capital that would allow them to do that. Um, but that position deteriorated quite badly um, during the course of, of, of the year. Uh, the, there is also an issue, uh, to be fair, about the, the... And again, it comes back to timescales, that even the Scotland uh, leases that are coming on won't necessarily be um, delivered for some time. So, therefore, the, the, the uh, sequencing of contracts are really important to the viability. Uh, they obviously got first EMP and the Murray East Pins, but the time frame for securing them, I might need to refer to my officials to help me on that. If there was one of the officials could come in and just give me um, a timeline, and uh, it might be helpful to the committee on that. If we can't, we'll, we'll give you that um, following this evidence session. But obviously, that's it was the company bidding for the, the contracts. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Is one of the officials in a position to assist the committee on that point the Cabinet Secretary has raised? Or... The David, David, David Stevenson, yeah. I think. David. Yeah. David. <coughs> uh, yeah, the BIFAB have, over the period since uh, BF Barnes took acquisition in April 18, have bid for numerous contracts. They have a, 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 a register of every contract that they bid for. And obviously, there's different stages as you go along from submitting your initial bid to then going through to the next stage and so on and so forth. So they have, I have seen a spreadsheet some time ago now where it had numerous um, contracts across offshore wind and oil and gas that they had been bidding for in various component parts, et cetera. As the Cabinet Secretary alluded to, they were only successful in securing two of those contracts, which was the Murray East Pin Piles, which was in the latter half of 18 um, that they won that and was undertaken over the course of 19 and uh, concluded at the start of um, January uh, last year, um, 19. Um, and then they obviously the first EMP contract, which was a, a Nigerian um, oil and gas uh, midwater arch, to be technical about it, 
um, which they secured in the in 2019 but, um, and undertook that work um, over the latter stage of 2019 and into the early part of this year and concluded before it set sail for Nigeria. So they, they have the company, um, obviously you need, again need to ask their permission to provide, but they have a, a register of numerous contracts that they actually um, tendered for. And I say there's different stages as you go through the process um, of whether you secure them or not. And obviously once you get to a stage, if you do if you're not progressed, then you fall out of that particular equation. It would be good to know, David, if the, the contracts that they bid for, who actually won them? Do, can, can that be supplied to the committee? Um, it or depends. On, well, oh, it depends who ultimately. Got. So, obviously, for an example, um, they did bid for the Concordan contract that you may be familiar for, which was a floating contract which was ultimately secured by um, a Spanish and Portuguese uh, fabrication yeah. company, the Spanish one being Navantia, which you've probably heard for. They also bid for, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, uh, they bid for the high wind uh, floating contract, but the problem with there was that um, it was due to the depth draft that the um, spires required. That was ultimately undertaken by, I think, a Norwegian contract contractor. Um, those are the, probably the two most uh, prominent ones. And obviously, you've touched on Sea Green as well, which was ultimately secured by a variety of fabricators um, in the Middle East and Far East. Uh, those are the, probably the most prominent ones. But there's a myriad of contracts that they have tendered for um, in between that, but obviously have not been secured. But I don't have the information available of every single contract that they've tendered for and who was the ultimate beneficiary of it. Okay, that's fine. Thanks, Convener. Right, thank you. Um, Mr. Simpson, do you have further questions on areas not already covered by you with the Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, thanks, Convener. I was going to explore the state aid question again, if that's okay. Um, you've confirmed, Cabinet Secretary, uh, that you took legal advice, although you're not prepared to share what that legal advice is. Um, we've heard that the GMB took its own legal advice and that was shared with the committee. It got legal advice from Lord Davidson. Uh, and if I can quote you what Lord Davidson said uh, in that advice, for the guarantee to be unlawful uh, as described, the critical predicate fact is that the market in the provision of guarantees and performance bonds would refuse to provide such a guarantee to BIFAB this assumes the Scottish Government has tested the market in some manner as regards BIFAB. So did you test the market? Did you assess the market position? So um, again, uh, for, for clarity, it's not that I'm prepared, I'm not prepared to provide the legal advice, that I can't provide the legal advice without breaking the ministerial code, which I think the, the member will be aware of. In terms of uh, legal advice, if I start to discuss other legal advice, I start to relay the content of legal advice, which again, uh, I'm not uh, allowed to do under my responsibilities, under the ministerial code. Um, I think it's uh, fair to say that the legal advice that was provided, um, if you look at the, the uh, and, and the, that's been widely shared, and, and, and I understand that, um, the, it was obviously based on partial information. And in what I've relayed, and, and I've had regular community contacts with local MSPs and MPs, and I, uh, after my first meeting, I, I wrote to them to help explain the context of legal advice for the Scottish Government, and in relation to you know, would we, you know, what we would, what we would do, particularly in the situation where there is no other investment available. So, the issue is about uh, other investment being uh, available, and would the would, would the Scottish Government operate in a way um, that anybody else would operate in that position? And the issue is, would a minority shareholder uh, in a, that situation provide investment in any shape or form? Um, that uh, any other minority shareholder w would do. And obviously, with a majority shareholder not provide, providing uh, any risk uh, whatsoever and taking a zero risk position, that is actually a very difficult position uh, to be in. But obviously, uh, the uh, partial information that was available 
um, to the, the law in question and the, 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 the council in question would mean that um, they would not have the information that we would have. And you know, if I can provide it, obviously, an indication to the concerns we had, the cash, and I've said this consistently, the cash flow situation um, of the company was, was very difficult. Indeed, that would not have been information that would have been available to other people providing um, either commentary or indeed legal advice. But I think that's probably a, the maximum that I can say without causing um, issues in terms of what I'm allowed to say or not allowed to say under the Ministry of Code. I've, I've not asked you to share your legal advice. I'm not going to ask you that. Yeah. I'm not asking you that. I ask you uh, if you would address the, the point made by Lord Davidson. The question was, did you assess the market position? I, I take it from your answer, the answer, the answer to that is no. The, we look at lots of different issues uh, issues in relation to state aid is what I can tell you. Right. Um, so Lord Davidson makes another point, which I'll put to you. I'll just quote what, what he says. It is perhaps remarkable that the decision by the Scottish Government to withdraw the guarantee based on the EU state aid regime took place when that regime will cease to apply to Scotland on the 31st of December 2020. Those are his words. If it had been so minded, the Scottish Government could have deferred the decision until after that date. So why didn't you just wait? Uh, I think you'll find that the company um, is in administration. The board have put the company in administration, and obviously issues around administration are multiple, but also reflect the cash position of a company at any point in time. And I've said consistently, consistently that the company was in a difficult position. That's not... Um, date sense, that, that's a date sensitive position to the point on which the board makes that decision. Uh, clearly, uh, in relation to NMG, uh, the assurance uh, there was a point in time that a decision uh, needed to be made because they made it just before the contract's given. And then the third point, which is probably the most opposite and the most important, you know, we're sitting here today uh, on the 15th of December and we have no idea what the state aid and the, you know, the level playing field arrangements will be uh, of the UK, uh, and it's due to leave in, in 17 days. The idea that we can any company can make any decisions uh, relying on state aid position when we have no idea what it will be, uh, it's, it's not a case that there will be no state aid. The issue is what type of state aid rules there will be. And as of now, and certainly at the point in time that decisions had to be taken, nobody, nobody uh, knew or would know what the state aid position would be. Had the UK government thought that there would be an opportunity um, for them to intervene in relation to state aid because of the changes that they were responsible for and they know what they would like to put in place they would be in the position that they could have provided state aid uh, support uh, in a legal and financial way at the point in time the fact that they didn't do that and that in my meetings with michael gove he said that he didn't do that and remember he's heavily involved in exactly the areas that you're talking about i think indicates that it would not have been appropriate to delay that decision until after january but you know i, I think that's uh, the, you, you have to make decisions at the point in time you're making them um, you can't just do it on a wing and a prayer of what we may, may or may not be stated rules in the future. Uh, and, and, and I think MD who thinks they would know what the stated rules are are obviously far more knowledgeable than, than any, any of the rest of us. I, I, I'll just say, I, I mean, I, don't, I do agree with you that we don't know, we don't know. what yeah. the position is going to be. I was quoting yeah. Lord Davidson. Yeah. Um, so I was very clear about that. So we, do, we actually don't know. Um, so I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. And now the Deputy Convener uh, who joined us remotely. Deputy Convener. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, four years ago, we, the decision was taken to leave the European Union as a UK, and there's 17 days to go, and we still don't know <laughs> what the arrangements will be post 31st of December for important matters such as this. Have you any confidence that we will know <laughs> soon after the end of December about what these particular arrangements might be? Uh, I, I, I am in the same position as, as the committee, and I just find it uh, appalling that businesses are having to make decisions, indeed governments are having to make decisions, without knowing uh, what the 
the rules will be and what the arrangements will be. This is a trade deal um, and therefore uh, trying to understand you know, the, the final uh, intricacies of that uh, negotiation uh, will, are, you know, is between the UK government and the EU. And in terms of what that will look like, of course we don't know because you know, one of the key areas that is, is part of the negotiation is you know, what's called the level playing field, but basically it's about business competitiveness and what advantages uh, could be provided or not provided to, to, to the UK. And clearly the single market is a, a clear uh, strength of the EU. It's the biggest uh, single market in the world. Uh, they are intent on protecting that single market. Uh, but they're also, uh, as part of the access to that single market, want to ensure that there aren't... Uh, uh, advantages given to the UK that could undercut uh, EU companies uh, in a way that would be anti-competitive. But, you know, I think it's absolutely remarkable that we're sitting here uh, days before EU exit and have no idea what operation uh, state A would be. I think some commentary seems to imply there'll be no state A rules whatsoever. And I think, I think you'd find even under the WTO provision, anti-competitiveness uh, is something, in fact, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's in many ways more open if we end up on no deal on a, a WTO for companies to, to intervene legally uh, to prevent... Uh, you know, anti-competitive practice and state aid can be seen by many in other parts of the world as, as anti-competitive. So that's the, the, the context that we're in. But I think that's a, a more general point about the difficulties of EU exit and after four years not knowing what the trading arrangements will be with the EU and what the subsidy arrangements may or may not be allowed uh, for companies at any point in time. And it's very difficult for any company uh, to make decisions uh, on, on that basis. I mean, you're, uh, you've made your position quite clear in terms of the state aid. It's often held up as the, the bogeyman and the straw that breaks the, the camel's back. But your letter to us, Cabinet Secretary, on the 8th of December seems to tell us quite clearly that an assurance package was possible um, prior to your determination that the company's performance and prospects and so on and so forth had deteriorated. So could you just clarify that? So the state aid, the further state aid assistance may have been possible had the company's performance, uh, investment plans and so on and so forth been adequate to allow that to continue. Is that is that what we're saying here? Yes, I mean the, the decision was one that we were legally uh, prohibited from continuing to provide financial support to the company. Uh, we were prepared uh, to provide financial support. So this was not a financial decision, it was a legal decision. Mm -hmm. the, the, the position changed, though, principally because of the, the performance position of the company, though. I think yes. your, your letter says here, I'll, get, I'll, I'll read it exactly, however, subsequent deterioration in the performance of the company, coupled with the loss of the Sea Green contract, meant it was no longer possible to provide an assurance package in a way that was stated compliant, but it had been prior to this, these circumstances had, developed. Had, had the company been in a better financial position, had the company had a future pipeline of work, had it been the type of company that MD would in, invest in and be prepared to invest in, that would have provided a different set of circumstances that would have allowed us to uh, support the company. We, we made it clear continuously to JV Driver that they had to make sure that the company was uh, supported in a financial uh, way to ensure, uh, and also to, to ensure that they were in a position to have future trading. Uh, and obviously you've heard from the um, the two, there was only two contracts secured um, over that period so, uh, of their ownership. So there were concerns that they were not in a position to have a future pipeline of activity and work. But we were per certainly prepared to provide that financial support had they been in a position to have that continual, um, that that uh, continuous pipeline. Which is why it's disappointing that they, uh, very disappointing that they didn't get the seeking contract. It had it had. Um, ramifications that not are not the responsibility of SE, SSE, and I've, I've, I'm clear about that, but actually had ramifications for the viability of the company. It's the viability of the company um, that is an issue, and it, which has led the board themselves to uh, seek administration. And mm -hmm. in, in, in trying to deal with that huge issue and that problem that we faced, is there any way we could have uh, reached out to the European Commission or could the UK have 
reached out to the European Commission? Is there any flexibility in the further application of the stated rules, even at, even at this last minute, well, <laughs> in our I'm, relationship I'm... with the European <laughs> Union? Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one, I don't think even if we were uh, to have done that, that uh, the, the, the relationship between the UK and the EU would have meant that the EU would suddenly bend rules uh, for one part of the European Union's mm. members. Uh, but secondly, it's inappropriate. You know, you don't. Uh, that's not. That's not practice. But you know, the in terms of uh, the. Provision of stated uh, and support, that's a responsibility uh, for the member state and indeed, the, in this case, uh, the administration, the Scottish Government. Our job is, um, obviously, in terms of st stated, is, is the responsibility um, of the Scottish Government. So, therefore, uh, as it is for the UK Government in their decisions, as it is for other governments taking decisions. And so, the, the responsibility for stated lies with us. Um, and we're responsible for for it, for carrying it out, um, and and also as I, I referred, it's it's even tighter than for the UK government because we're governed by the Scotland Act in relation to that. As ministers, at the point mm -hmm. we make decisions, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't so be it wouldn't have been appropriate to you know, it would have been right. inappropriate to contact them in the first place, uh -huh. um, and actually even if 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 anybody thought we could and we should. Um, the idea that they would bend the rules for the for the uh, constituent part of the UK when they were about to leave, and where actually the issue of state aid and a level playing field was absolutely uh, at the uppermost in terms of the conversation and negotiations. Um, you know that is that is the position. And you know, can I say when okay. I was in Brussels but, 16 years ago, it was state aid, uh, level playing field, and fisheries were always seen as the issues that would be the most contentious, and they still are. And we still don't know the result of that position. But just lastly, then, uh, just looking to the future, uh, should circumstances like these arise again, uh, what, what role does Scotland have in this? Post EU um, arrangement in terms of state aid, we, we, do we just not know a thing? Do we have any role or any influence at all if a future scenario like this were to present itself? Well, to we'll, us? Yeah, we, we would continue to be responsible for state aid provision. The problem is we don't know the rules and uh, and regulations and as, as to how that will operate. That's that's the issue. So yeah. we're, we will be responsible for carrying out compliance with a set of rules and regulations that because we're not a member ourselves, we're not even negotiating. And secondly, we have no idea what the negotiations will deliver. We don't even know if there will be uh, an arrangements or not. And you know, I think the idea that people think that all of a sudden in January there'll be no state aid or no and no competition rules mm -hmm. whatsoever, I think is, is, is misguided. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. Back to you, Convener. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Convener. And now questions from Richard Lyle on areas that you've not already covered, Richard? Yeah, and I think there's got to be actually some comments also. Cabinet Secretary, it's very frustrating. We've played by the rules and it's cost us. Other countries don't seem to play by the rules. They actually bend them and they just, or they just ignore them. So what's your comment to DF Barnes talked about the need for protectionism through legislation? Can you explain why this isn't an option for Scotland? Well, uh, I've just answered the question that we have responsibility for obviously uh, delivering and administering uh, the state aid uh, situation uh, uh, and complying with that uh, within the context of the market that obviously we operate in, in within the EU. And in terms of that challenge, uh, it can op it can come in different countries and in, in, in different ways. So, in the majority of, uh, of countries, if a decision is taken, and 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 it has done. I mean, I'm familiar with one from my other part of my portfolio in relation to film um, in Spain. The the the, the government funded uh, to a huge amount. I mean, hundreds of millions uh, film studio, which was seen as uh, and challenged under state aid rules, and they had to then. Uh, forfeit that funding, and it, it went to hundred you know, of hundred millions of pounds of cost because it wasn't state aid compliant. And um, that obviously is the example where somebody takes you to court, or you challenge, or makes a challenge to the EU under anti-competitiveness. Uh, uh, in terms 
of the responsibilities here, uh, not only obviously is, is, is that a, an issue in terms of uh, any challenge of anti-competitiveness uh, anti and, and obviously challenge on state aid, but also, as I've referred to under the Scotland Act, um, governments uh, and ministers have a responsibility at the point in time they're making decisions to be compliant with international treaties and arrangements and international law, of which state aid um, is one aspect, which means that instead of even waiting for somebody to then challenge you at a later day, and they may or may not challenge you, uh, we have a responsibility at the point in time that we take decisions. The UK government's uh, responsibilities are such that um, they could be challenged at a later date in court or challenged uh, in, in, the, in the current arrangements with, with the EU. So uh, that's how, I suppose, in practice, it, 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 you know, that it's been operating to date. Um, obviously, there are issues of how it might work in, in the future. So therefore, uh, the point you're making, however, in terms of protectionism or what uh, DF Barnes would have sought as protectionism is probably more in line with um, trying to ensure that there's supply chain elements within any contract and uh, for leasing. And that's why, going back to the original discussion we had at the start of this session, the contract for difference would, would have helped their protection because that would have um, enabled them and indeed other Scottish uh, supply chain uh, companies to be able to be part of the, uh, the 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 contracts that were delivered for um, the increasing number of offshore uh, renewable sites uh, that, that there are. So that I think that's their perception is more about being able to um, not so much get. They may be under perception and obviously thought that we'd be, it was an open checkbook from the Scottish Government, but it could never be, and that's not accountable. To, that's not a good public finance position to be in. But I think their um, uh, indication is, is as much about protectionism that can be secured elsewhere, where uh, governments or can uh, dictate that there is X amount of uh, supply chain as part of the contract. That's why the contract for difference uh, consultation that's on just now is really important because if we shift the focus on helping support supply chains, then I think that will uh, give a, a fighting chance to be able to win on tenders, which, you know, the, the quality of the work and the, the opportunity for the tender is there. And we saw that in terms of um, some of the, the, the competitiveness that we've seen from, uh, uh, particularly from Bifab, compared to European yards. The problem is when you've got a global market and you've got cheap labour that can undercut, and it's a race to the bottom in terms of terms, conditions, but also price. And you know, I'm not prepared, and I don't think in Scotland we are prepared to cut uh, workers' rights um, in, in regard to that. Can I also add, in terms of that relation to the EU discussions and negotiations uh, just now, and it's one of the areas I discussed um, with the EU Commissioner just recently, is there, um, they have got particular issues around uh, what we would term in terms of fair work and also in terms of workers' rights. And obviously one of the other ways that the UK may, and, and I hope they don't, and uh, they don't do this, is undercut um, uh, wages and conditions and, and drive down wages and conditions in uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK as part of that uh, liberation and freedom that they're they're, they're seeking as part of the EU negotiations, and that would be problematic, uh, and it's something I think we should resist. But that's a danger in in terms of what uh, can be done in terms of uh, the after January. We, we don't know what the situation will be, but that would be very dangerous indeed. Now, I just don't think, even on the you know, protecting the, the, the wages and conditions that we have, um, that we can compete uh, when you've got an undercut undercutting of uh, tenders because the tenders are all driven, all driven by cost and cheap electricity. It's just not possible in that situation. You can try, and, and obviously some contracts can be secured, but we've got to be realistic that that market situation has to change, and the key lever that uh, is in play is the contract for difference. So if it's always continually on price, basically we can't win any contract and you know so we really we really have to sorry we really need to wake it up and try and do something given that almost every eu country spends more on state aid take france for example than the uk does are you confident that scottish and uk governments are not being unduly cautious in their interpretations of eu state aid rules and therefore could we not just ignore them now 
Well, I, 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 your first sentence I would disagree with because it is possible to compete. It's just extremely hard, I think, is the, 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 my pushback on that. In terms of other governments, you know, I'm, I'm a government minister that works with other governments. I'm not going to start a, a, a attacking other governments at the, this point. That might be an issue that you might want to reflect where they stand. But in, in relation to other companies, the, you know, they, they have different criteria for, I suspect, the, the analysis that you have, I'd quite like to see in terms of the percent on, on of GDP and state aid, I think they would be calculated in different ways and, and different methods by different countries. But if you have got a situation where you've got uh, state-owned energy companies, then you're in a different position. So in terms of your percentage of support that's been provided, uh, but that's because you are the majority or you're, you're the only shareholder. So there are different companies that operate in, in, in different ways. All I'm saying is I'm responsible for what I do as a minister and I'm constrained even further than other states because they can be challenged in court after the event, whereas I've got to take a decision at the point in time um, that you know, a state aid issue arises. That's because of the Scotland Act. OK, thanks. Continue. Um, thank you. And we now come to questions from Alex Rowley on matters you've not already covered, Mr Rowley. OK, thank you. Can I, can I also home in on the state aid? I mean, it's, it was interesting when Jason Fudge, DF Barnes, gave, gave evidence, because he said ultimately the reason that Bifab was not successful in its pursuit uh, of some of the contracts uh, the major projects had nothing to do with the level of investment in the business or the yards. It had to do with foreign international low-cost competition, which was in many cases state-financed. Um, the single largest factor that led to the situation we currently face in BIFAB. So you can understand that many workers and trade unions feel that there is not a level playing field, as, as, as Richard Lello has said. But I noticed in evidence for a previous session, the 24th of November, Jim Smith of SSE, he said that he estimated that there is a difference of at least 10% prices in Europe and those in the Far East. Yeah. Now, I, think, I think we've had some evidence that say it's even higher than that. Um, so, so, so then that led one of the other witnesses to say no European country could compete with the Middle East. Yet, in terms of state aid, etc., uh, they are, because we heard for the GMB, for Hazel Nolan, who says that France is a country that has historically been over-reliant on nuclear uh, and has come to the renewables industry for offshore quite late, yet it has made clear that companies that want to win contracts to produce offshore wind in France need to, need to build in France. So, you know, all, all that evidence would suggest that other European countries are up against the same competition as, as we are in terms of the Middle East, that in the Middle East it's about low wages, it's, they, it's, they are providing state aid and state support, yet the contracts for Scottish renewables has all been gone, or a lot of them has been gone to the Middle East. How, how, how does that add up? So um, I think quite often when people think about city, they think about the domestic situation in Scotland or indeed the European uh, the European situation, as in the legislative framework of state aid, but state aid is just you know, government supporting particular industries. And you're right that in, pl in places like China and in the UAE, you know, the Far East, that you know, state aid comes in different shapes and, and guises, and these companies can be supported uh, from a state, you know, and, and the state provides financial support for those companies to give them an advantage. So that's that's the context. It's not just about what's happening within the UK or the EU. It's wider, and I think that's correct to, to give that perspective, which means there's a price, price differential, which you've, you've obviously had diff you've, you've had different evidence of, as well. So the issue in France um, is that they will not be operating under the same uh, rules under contract per difference as as the UK. So the France. Uh, can and should be doing what I think the UK should do under its contract for difference. And obviously the contracts that are, and the leases that are currently being contracted for work are being driven by the historic and the current, you know, and what is the, still the current uh, rules on contract for difference, which is all about price and which is about you know, cheap and how do we get the, the, the how, how do we resource the cheapest electricity um, and, the price, and the price is determining it. And that's the market that the UK has um, deliberately chosen to, to be in. 
Uh, that is not um, a position that the, the French are taking. The French are obviously taking a different position where they want to put a premium on uh, French companies getting getting more in the terms of the supply chain. So if the UK was to change their licensing uh, requirements to be similar to the French, then at least they'd be able to compete on the basis with the French. But that does not, as we said, then preclude in, under whatever terms challenges in, in, in terms of competing with low wages and you know, there's a terrible working conditions that, that many workers uh, are working in, in in other parts of the world. So, so, so I, I understand the, and I acknowledge right at the, far, the start, the contract of, of difference, and, and that is a major factor, and I acknowledge that, uh, and, and it's a, a factor that, that is a responsibility of the UK government and needs to be addressed. But if, if these contracts from the Middle East are at least 10%, and, and, and I do think that it's, further, it's much higher than that, yet other European countries are able to use the same state aid rules that, that, that we are losing out to these Middle East companies on, um, and, and they're not breaking state aid. But we are, because it's not about, we're not losing contracts to other European countries the, the, the major contracts that we, we've lost in the case of Bifab has been to the Middle East. So I suppose it's the supply chain and there are different elements to, to it, but you're, you, again, that will come into, the, I suppose, the, uh, and again, I'm quite happy for, uh, again, the energy officials to come in um, to answer anything that they think is additional to what I'm about to say. But it's also about the developers. And obviously, if you've got European developers who are actually taking out the licences and the issues of the relationship between the licence holder and the, con you know, and, and the contract, and that, that, that's an issue of, again, points of influence. And where, where is the leverage that can be provided? So obviously, you know, a number of the actual developers in the North East and indeed UK waters are not UK companies, but they are European companies. And that might be another way and point where you can have leverage in terms of the provision. But again, it's about the the, the and that's within the, the I suppose their relationship with their own government in relation to that. But they're still operating under that licensing regime, um, and that's where you know if it's a absolutely open, competitive, free for all, you know, race to the bottom. That's that's different. But it's also about I think the advantages of having a domestic, you know, domestic developer. So therefore, should we expect um, UK owned companies that are developing in the North East to uh, provide um, supply chain support? I think we should for a number of reasons that it's in their interest to have a skilled base and also closer to home. And that can also then drive down, drive down, well, drive up quality of the work, but also in that um, certainty of supply chains, especially bearing in mind what we've just gone through in the pandemic and the interruption which we, we saw in us had consequences, not least for um, you know, some of the issues we're facing just now. So actually, a resilience in the supply chain is going to be important for those developers and therefore it's in their interest. Uh, but it's the levers you can have to influence that. But if, I don't know if David Stevenson, if this is something you can comment on in terms of the ownership of the companies that are developing and whether there's any aspects of points of intervention or uh, leverage that either um, their own governments in their own countries can can exert um, but also in terms of uh, how they can you know help support supply chain their own supply chains because there's there's obviously the different players in the whole in, in, the, in the whole market operation and there are different points of influence within that some of it is the, at the point of time the license is given some of it's to do with other aspects so it's a point of leverage and, and intervention you've got and obviously in Scotland we're far restricted compared to, to the rest of the UK even within that um, because again the reserved and devolved parts of that but is there anything uh, I think David Stevenson you can add to anything I've said there or correct anything actually if I've, 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 I've misled anybody um, as, as you've touched on cabinet secretary it all really hinges around the, the contract for difference process and how different countries operate um, the procurement of their electricity at the end of the day. Um, obviously, under the, in the UK, we um, is bid on price and the price of electricity, as you've touched on. So once a, a developer has been successful in securing a contract for difference, then obviously what they do is they go to the market um, to actually, um, on, a, on the price of a project, the average offshore wind farm is about two and a half, 
three billion pounds uh, per car thereabouts it will cost uh, to um, actually fund it. And obviously, a certain percentage of that they do get back to the contract for difference. Others they go to the market to actually source for uh, debt equity. So they would go to the market under the um, an EPCI contract, an engineering procurement construction contract, and then that's where you get companies that would come in to actually bid for that work. So for an example, if you use the NNG example, um, EDF um, went to the market and Saipen won the fabrication contract. It is then for them to then go to the market again because they've been given a set price by um, if, if, sorry by EDF to actually secure the jacket structures. They can go to the world to say who can bid for these jackets at basically the cheapest possible price. And that's where you find that in that particular situation, obviously BIFAB and the other European yards are being competitive, but they're still looking for the cheapest possible price. And therefore, that's why we've seen that um, obviously the people, uh, the Middle East and the Far East can actually produce these jackets a lot easier. But the fundamental principle of it is here is, as the Cabinet Secretary has touched on, is back to the CFP process, how much um, the companies bid into the auction process, how much they secure average cost at the moment is about £40 per megawatt, how much that they can secure, and then can go to the market and actually um, tender for this work through an EPCI contractor basis. So, um, as the Cabinet Secretary has alluded to, there was a consultation on the CFD process to make changes through the summer, um, and there's currently a live one more specifically on the supply chain process, which is due to conclude on the 18th of uh, January, which the UK government are looking to make changes, which will um, introduce penalties for actually contractor, uh, sorry, developers that in their supply chain plans that they have to um, submit as part of this process, if they don't honour the commitments that they set out in those, there will be penalties down the line. But obviously, we need to wait for the conclusion of the consultation to determine exactly what those penalties are likely to be. So I want to come on to two other points on that. But firstly, can I ask, has the Scottish Government given any other guarantees, financial guarantees, bonds, to uh, the... The, the contract, the offshore wind farm, EDF, NNG, off the coast of Fife, has, has any of these other companies had any guarantees from the Scottish Government around bonds, insurance? Uh, I'm not quite clear what you're asking. In terms of the, there was, so in terms of the assurances, the energy is massive, of which uh, with uh, some... Uh, Discussion and support from a number of parties, NG were uh, so EDF were prepared to uh, persuade SIPEM to carve out only eight. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't you know all of them by any means because it's far far bigger. But in terms of the other jackets that are being produced, no the jackets. I mean, the whole the whole contract has EDF who who ultimately uh, are 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 going to run that that site. Have they had any financial? Uh, support or assurances from the Scottish Government? So, um, and again, officials might want to come in um, on this one. It, we, as part of you know, making sure that we looked at every opportunity, uh, trying to identify what could be done, we tried to identify whether we could provide an assurance to EDF and SIPEM directly um, in terms of providing. Uh, uh, pr providing the work, but of course those discussions, you know, in terms of um, whether it could be done, and that's a kind of suggestion of some kind of managed process by which SIPEM could conduct the work and energy still in the yard using the workforce, but not involving, um, you know, BIFAB itself. These were all areas that we have explored and we were continuing to, to explore. Should um, somebody come in and who knows, because you know, the Saipem are out to market just now um, for those jackets, should somebody come in, um, we would normally expect, because it would be normal practice for the company to provide or go to the market to provide assurance in the bonds. It's highly unusual for the, for, for the government to, to need to, to provide that. But I may be answering the wrong question, so I'm, um, I, I can either come back in writing and consider what okay. it is that you're asking, unless there's anything that officials can, can add to that in terms of assurances, what so I think it might be help, more helpful if we can 
indicate um, the assurances that have been provided uh, historically might be. Is that what you're asking? Well, um, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. If, has, has EDF, in terms of the whole contract and completing the contract, has the Scottish Government given any financial assurances to them? Um, that is not something that I'm uh, aware of, uh, and I'm not sure we would, and why why we would, and they haven't sought it. So, because of contracting with well, Cypher and others. Perhaps come back to that, and then. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything that MD wants to add at this point from officials that I may be missing the point on? Um, David, David Stevenson. Yeah. Just to confirm, if, if the question specifically relates, has EDF um, or the NNG project secured any other assurance um, from the Scottish Government? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only one that we had, um, in principle, um, had given um, authority for through the Finance Committee was for the IFAB um, uh, eight jackets. Yeah. Okay. I'll come back to that. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah. Um, so we move on then. Last week, the Crown Estate confirmed that developers need not come out to the Scottish supply chain and the supply chain development statement. Uh, so any developer could come in for this later round of licences, which, which sits with, it will be Scottish ministers that will grant them. Uh, they would not have to give any kind of guarantee whatsoever to the, the Scottish supply chain, and they could walk away with the contract and with a licence and then award that contract to the Middle East. Is there not a problem with that? And specifically, you, you mentioned yourself Brexit. But given we do not know, you know, one of the clear sticking points seems to be between between Brussels and the UK government is around this this this, this whole question, uh, but uh, trade deals. But I noticed that in terms of the trade deal that the UK have signed up with Japan, the there, there is reportedly there a specific trade deal that, that, that prevents either side from indefinitely guaranteeing the debts of struggling companies to provide open-ended bailouts without approved restructuring plans. So given the fact that we do not know what the final deal or no deal is going to be, we don't know what trade deals are going to be done, then why are we proceeding with these licences with the Crown Estate saying that there can be no uh, supply chain guarantee for Scottish workers? So the, there's a lot in that. Can I maybe just reflect on the, the trade deals that the, the UK are effectively announcing just now, including the Japan one? Effectively, they're rollovers of the, uh, the, the, the EU uh, arrangements. So, therefore, in terms of issues around company bailout or, or state aid, etc., there's, there's nothing new in that. It's a it's a rollover from what the current position is in relation to state support. Um, and in terms of the Scotland and the Crown Estate issues, there are, I suppose are two things I want to say around that. Uh, one is uh, the Scotland supply chain statements uh, will be. Uh, influential in ensuring the support for the Scottish supply chain. However, some of the restrictions in that are similar to effectively planning that you would have and you'd be familiar with um, on land where you can't secure uh, supply chain preference as part of a planning condition, as part of regular planning. It's similar to in terms of the Scotland uh, leasing. What they can do, though, is provide uh, penalties um, should these not be provided for and indeed they can actually terminate the, the lease and the contract. So there are levers. It's not to say that they can't be strengthened, and certainly in the market conditions, I think it's important that we do look at that. In terms of the idea of uh, stopping or halting um, uh, you know, Scotland, I think that's very dangerous uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary one, actually, is that we will not meet our targets for climate change if we don't, pro you know, we don't progress and keep the momentum and the position of the Scotland leasing uh, and the Scotland leases going. So I think that is a, an absolute imperative for us as a nation if we're serious. And remember, it wasn't the, the Scottish Government, it was actually the Parliament that set the even stronger um, uh, targets in terms of climate change uh, 
and in terms of our, our, our proposals for 2030 in particular, that's a collective responsibility that everybody in the Parliament should have because it was Parliament that impressed on that. We would not be able to uh, 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 obviously meet those targets if we don't uh, press ahead with Scotland. So it's absolutely essential that we do that. It's also in terms of the market signalling and in terms of the position. Um, obviously, the, the market matters in terms of attracting uh, bids in and to make sure that uh, there is a, a good uh, renewables energy market that's attractive. Uh, Scotland is well placed for lots of different reasons, but it also has disadvantages in terms of the challenges, not least deep water and, and, and in terms of the operations. And there are other opportunities elsewhere in the UK, so it's absolutely essential that you know, we advertise and market uh, Scott, uh, the, the Scotland leases as being an attractive proposition. That also provides us with opportunities for those supply chains. Uh, can those be strengthened? I think uh, the, the, there is an opportunity to do that. And certainly in terms of the different timescales, you wouldn't have to stop the leases to strengthen some of the operations of the supply chain uh, statement and indeed uh, the conditions on that. That's, again, not my um, direct area, but it's certainly I have an interest in, uh, for probably the same reasons that the committee has, to make sure the supply chain uh, delivery uh, is, is strong. And uh, if we have the opportunity, which I, th I think we can, to improve on that, I think we should do to strengthen it. But remember, the supply chain, this comes to my second point, the supply chain statements also uh, are accompanied uh, with the contract for difference uh, influences as well. So that's why we need the, the, the double uh, support for those two mechanisms to help improve our situation. So, so my, my reading of the, the, the trade deal that's been done with Japan is that if that's a rollover, my reading of that is that, that we would not have been in breach of a, a state aid rules had we continued to support BIFAB to restructure and become a financially viable company. Uh, and that's, that's why I think actually the legal opinions should have been published because they are only opinions and there are other opinions that say differently. But can I ask you finally, in terms of climate change, because this is the argument that was, that was told to us last week that we can't guarantee uh, or we would be at risk if we tried to guarantee Scottish workers and Scottish jobs for our renewable sector. I had also always understood that it was accepted that in order to meet our climate change targets, there would have to be a just transition in terms of jobs. But the way that it's starting to look is that Scotland's going to be driven, in order to achieve our climate targets, we're going to be driven uh, to be a low-skill, low-wage economy because we're not going to be able to achieve the just transition because there's not going to be the green jobs to tr transition to. Can you see the concerns that trade unions uh, and workers are actually putting in terms of the agenda that you're pursuing? It's, well, it's, that's not the agenda we're pursuing. The agenda we're pursuing is to make sure that we have uh, high-skilled and quality jobs, but I think you're right to identify the challenges to meet climate change targets and how do we make sure we do that with a just transition. So I can reassure you... Uh, uh, Mr. Riley, but also the, the committee that, you know, from my perspective and our influence, and it maybe is an issue as we develop, and obviously we've got the, the climate change uh, statement uh, due soon as well, and the plan on that, and the skills, as I said, I talked earlier about the skills base. It's because, precisely because, we want to make sure we've got high quality jobs that we do need to ensure that that's end to end, uh, and it is end to end in terms of the operation, that we have good quality jobs and a just transition. So I'm absolutely clear about that. So the work that we've asked the offshore wind council to look at the different elements of how we can actually improve the opportunities for supply chain, how we can work across from developers and also companies to make sure that we have that. The work that's been chaired by Professor Jim McDonald, I think is really important in, in doing that. Uh, but we also need to make sure in terms of the £20 billion um, opportunities there that we have to maximise what can be done and delivered in Scotland. And that's why, you know, unlike you know, the UK, that doesn't have the supply chain statements that we have. But there is a danger, in, uh, and, and, and this is where the caution is, in terms of if you make that um, so definitive 
um, that you're putting a percentage on, uh, companies could, th th there is a danger that the statements they make may not be the maximum position that we think they can secure in terms of jobs. So we, we, we're at early stages in the Scotland leasing. We've yet to see what the, 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 the outcome of that is in terms of what people are committing to and being involved in. But I know from the experience of talking to uh, international companies that are coming uh, and want they specifically want to develop in Scotland and they specifically want to use our supply chain because we have a quality uh, we have a quality workforce that might not be available in other countries uh, and, and to the level that we've got so therefore I think that is um, a, a absolutely key to make sure that not only do we meet our climate change responsibilities, but we have a just transition. And that's not just the responsibility of the government. The climate change targets are a collective responsibility, and the just transition is a collective responsibility. Uh, but I, uh, I can assure you that in terms of what I expect to see from the Scotland leases and my conversation uh, with the Crown Estate and also uh, with the Minister for Energy, is I want to have a robust system that ensures that we maximise those uh, supply chain uh, opportunities, but I would caution you to saying, like, to have a leap into the unknown uh, post January to somehow think that that's going to be a solution uh, to to resolve resolve the issue. And I think it will come with consequences, which would be very serious for jobs and see less jobs if we were to walk away from the market at this stage. I think that would be very very dangerous indeed. Gordon Macdonald. Thanks very much, Kadina. There's no doubt that the Scottish Government is committed to improving the Scottish supply chain, but we heard last week from uh, Simon Hodge of the Crown Estates, who said the level of commitment that developers make to Scottish content will not be a material consideration in the award of contracts. Now, he, said, he then went on to say there are two key aspects here. One is state aid regulations, which we've talked a lot about this yeah. morning. But the other one he talked about was UK competition law. And I'm just wondering if you had any comment on the impact of UK competition law in awarding contracts. So, I mean, that, that, this is the bottom line in terms of what that competition law will look like and what it will look like after the competition laws have been negotiated mm -hmm. in relation to the EU, which is, yeah. as we said, is still a live situation. Although my understanding, current reading of the negotiations, it's not necessarily what the content would that be, it's the resolution and who would de determine yeah. it. Because obviously the European Court of Justice is politically for our, our friends in the Conservative Party, um, and particularly at UK level, is problematic. So you know, it's part of how do we actually resolve uh, differences and disputes when there's an issue around competitiveness and anti-competitiveness. Um, so uh, this is an unknown situation. We don't know what the position would be. But, but the Act's been in place since 1998. The UK competition, competition law. Well, has been in place so, since 1998. Yeah, so in, in terms of... the internal market. Yeah, so the, 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 the issue around the operations of competition law will be key, not actually just to this, obviously this is the issue that you're focusing on as a, a committee, but going forward, what does that look like? And, you know, although there's rhetoric around uh, potential for advantages in terms of more generous uh, provision of state support to companies, um, we don't know what that looks like yeah. in any shape or form. And actually, in shaping that, even in the UK, it's absolutely essential, and this is where you know, there's a lot of work that Mike Russell's been involved in, is, is to ensure that it's done on a four-nation basis, because obviously um, there, there, there are issues, because even within the, the, the UK, the, you know, that's where the common frameworks you've, you've mm. looked at. I'm not sure if this committee, how much this committee's uh, been involved in looking at the common frameworks development. But that's the whole point of the common framework, so that mm -hmm. you can maximise your opportunities, but at the same time, you're not necessarily then disadvantaging, disadvantaging others. We do think that the common framework is the right thing to do. We think the internal market bill is not the right way to pursue it, but the common frameworks which precede uh, the work, the, the latter work on the internal market, whereas actually the way that we would operate that and try and operate a system within, within the UK that would uh, enable us to our own domestic uh, companies to flourish in lots of different areas, not just uh, renewables. But that's, that's a challenge. But we cannot put business on pause because the UK hasn't de determined its, mm. uh, its rules. I, I think that's very, very dangerous in, in, indeed in terms of the outcomes uh, because you know, we are not the only players in town. You know, we've got great resources, absolutely. Uh, but you know, there are challenges and... Uh, uh, obviously, there are different types of energy provision as well, and that's why I actually think that Scotland should have a more diverse uh, aspect and approach to, to its energy provision 
Uh, I think the developments and announcements on hydrogen are really welcome. But again, it's not just about offshore renewables that we need to make sure that we've got a just transition. It's a similarly on hydrogen as well. So I think that needs a, a focus. You, you mentioned common frameworks, and you, they're, they're being developed at the moment, and as you quite rightly say, between the devolved nations and the UK government. But is there a danger that in order to enable the function of the UK internal market to continue, that this 60% um, of the UK government is talking about having in a supply chain will be at the UK level and not at Scottish government level. In other words, we won't be able to specify a specific Scottish-only content in a contract because UK competition law will specify that it has to be at a UK level. Um, well, that, well, that's been um, a, a great deal of the problem I think we've had in a number of areas where you know the contribution of Scotland exceeds what the, the rest of the UK is. So it's a, and that you can see that applying. I mean, you know, I'm not to get into agriculture, but that's applied in, in some of the kind of uh, agro, agricultural payments and, and under cap, etc. Um, in terms of uh, what we do need. To, to look at is how do we, I mean, actually, I think this is where I think the work with the UK government on the Working Party is really important because it's about growing the opportunities as opposed to limiting the percentage shares between different parts of the UK. It's how do we actually grow the wider uh, market itself. And I think the target on 60% is, is, is what we should be doing. But it's, again, that's a, a period up to 2030. That's a long, how, and so the issue is, and that's why I go back to the work of the Offshore Wind Council and the developers and supply chain working together. How do we get to that? And there is a bit of kind of how can you have, and this is where I think it should be, is a bit more about collective planning between the developers and the supply chain about, okay, what is what is the maximum we can get in terms of energy sources combined with the jobs, which Annette Riley was talking about in terms of just transition, and how do we make that how do we make that market work more pr profitably for all of us mm -hmm. and provide the jobs as well as the, the, the energy sources? Uh, rather than say, rather than a very individualistic, competitive free market approach on free uh, on price of electricity, which has driven it to date, mm -hmm. and actually some more planned, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's state complete state control. But the state can help bring people together, which I think is a, a, a good way of doing it. Uh, and I think that would be a, a way, and that would be a sensible way to grow the energy market in a way that um, you know has the. We can grow the energy market, we can meet our climate change obligations, and we can make sure we've got good quality jobs. That would be the sensible type of planning that, and remember, energy is reserved still um, to Westminster that we see happening. So, therefore, I think looking at it not necessarily just from an energy point of view, because to be fair to my colleagues in, in, that have got res, uh, responsibility for energy, they've been pursuing the CFD issue for some time. But I think looking at it from the other lens, from a supply chain lens, would actually be a better way to make sure that the energy markets works for the supply chain, the consumer, yes, which is the, the consumer has been king in this, uh, and, and, and many of us argued for cheap electricity because bills were too high. So I'm not saying that we're, you know, that it was a wrong necessarily a wrong thing to do. It might have been appropriate at the time, but it's had consequences, which I don't think have helped uh, Scottish jobs, and that's what has to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I think the timing of your inquiry, I think, is. Is, is very appropriate and I think will support obviously what you know what we, we are doing in trying to influence that agenda but I think um, you know convener you know I'm not sure your time scale for your publication but I think trying to get something into the process as quickly as possible um, I'm not sure if I'm your last um, witness or not and the timing of actually influencing this um, is, is very opportune and I think if you do it on a collective basis you may have a different view necessary from what the government's putting for you, but we can obviously share what we're we're putting forward, um, particularly for, for CFD. Um, then I think that's a, a time to to reshape the market. You know, it might not be of a you know it's it might not be of uh, uh, of the timing that I that we might have thought in a planned way. But you know, it's it's, it's a it, this is something that you know. I, 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 I say, you know, as a, the economy secretary that spent the first six months of my role dealing with crisis situation of COVID, you know, I want to to as part of my responsibilities where I can just now help try and shape this market in a better way for both jobs, um, and, uh, and and the opportunities for Scotland, and that's what I'll attempt to do. Just on the last point you mentioned about uh, contracts for differences provided cheap electricity. Um, is that really the case? Because um, in Scotland, the, the cost of electricity has went up 31 per cent since 2010, and the EU Energy Company a, a Committee 
has, uh, does an analysis every two years of 30 European countries and the UK is in the top 10 most expensive electricity. So, again, I'll probably use your own analogy, that's on a UK, it was on a UK wide basis and, and obviously that's one of the drivers, that was a policy driver and that's why government's policies can help drive not just the direct market but indirectly other aspects and that's why, and that's historically where uh, the UK government's been but I think they're, they're changing their position and, and you know, hearing the, uh, the ambitions, particularly we've got the, the UK um, energy white papers now have been produced and obviously with COP26 uh, there'll be a, a great focus and attention um, on the UK and how it's behaving and operating in this area and the drivers in it and I think Scotland has got a lot of experience and expertise and we've also got challenges that we've had to face up to um, and we can bring them to bear as part of influencing that debate not just in Scotland but also in the UK and also globally as well. Okay, thanks very much. Any, any final questions from committee members? Um, Mr Simpson? Yeah, thanks very much. I, I actually just follows on from that because you, meant, you mentioned Cabinet Secretary, the Energy White Paper. Um, and in that, that, in that white paper, a very meaty document, I don't expect you to have read uh, every word of it by now, um, but it speaks of doing a North Sea transition, transition deal with the oil and gas sector in the early part of 2021, um, and, and there's an aim of by 2030 quadrupling the amount of offshore wind that we produce across the UK. So. Uh, and, and we've also got this joint working group, of course. Do you, do you see opportunities for Scotland in all this? Um, uh, yes, I think the, the, the people want to see that deal come to fruition. It's one of the reasons very early on in terms of determining that through COVID, uh, we, would, we, we would definitely have a green recovery. And I took, obviously, the advice of the advisory group on economic recovery. So in July, I committed that £62 million for the... Um, energy transition because that was a down payment saying we're serious about this we think there's opportunities here in that transition if you look at acorn uh, who are also getting some of this investment in that area and and also in the skills area how we can give um confidence to people to change skills and transition the skills so you know this is something that is long awaited uh, long expected it's something that I've spoken uh, particularly to uh, Nadeem Sahawi in my discussions uh, on the quadrilateral meetings in relation to opportunities, that it was absolutely imperative that if the, the UK, with their responsibilities, uh, saw part of the economic recovery being in this area and, and the opportunities there. So when you're talking about growing the market, that's what I, I was talking about earlier, is actually instead of just necessarily saying what share of this market do we get, how do we grow the market, but a condition of that has to be a just transition and going back to Alex Riley points the jobs, because I think that's essential. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm conscious of time. I think Richard Lyle had one, and this will be the final question if you've um, time to, to answer that. Okay. Yep. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just to round it off, what's the Scottish Government's strategic vision for supporting struggling firms? What lessons have been learned from BIFAP? Um, I, think, I think there are, are genuine lessons that it's right to intervene to support struggling companies, uh, but there are also are, are, are issues around that. I think, and I will say to the committee now, that although insolvencies uh, currently are below the rate last year. We know that all the different interventions um, are, you know, particularly the sea bills, the, the, the loans through COVID, um, certainly in terms of uh, the furlough scheme, have all helped companies keep going in terms of survivability and also the additional funding that the Scottish Government has uh, provided uh, in terms of, I mean, most recently I think we're about 570 million in the latest round as well as on top of the 2.3 billion has helped companies keep going. But I have concerns we're going to hit the, the double whammy of COVID and Brexit and what that's going to mean in terms of uh, implications for companies. I think it might not necessarily be immediate in the first quarter, but I think the second quarter uh, after April will be problematic. And that's why uh, some of the work and the recommendations of the Economic Advisory Group was, you know, what does management of equity stakes look like? Both for, if you look at the, U the City UK report in terms of uh, the financial institutions themselves, but ten potentially of the government. But, you know, government's um, involvement with private companies doesn't come with a blank check and and so therefore it's absolutely essential that we 
uh, obviously supporting strategic companies, uh, but also there needs to be a structured way through that. And obviously the banks have a, a, a role to play in that as well. I am a bit hopeful that the cash balance of many companies at this point, because of C-bills, because of the other grants, uh, particularly areas that are not necessary, I'm not talking about hospitality, which we know absolutely is, is, is in a very difficult position, uh, but other companies may be able to weather the period on the short term, that's the intelligence we've got. But in terms of our strategic approach, obviously I've just reflected the ambitions we have on a green recovery, uh, but also that um, can translate into the digital uh, aspects and other areas as well. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for your time this morning thank and you. Uh, also your officials um, online. And I'll now suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session. <laughs>